Hare Krishna. Yes. Hare Krishna. So you want to so yes. Yes, Proji. Yeah, you want to start with the questions then? Yes, bro. And begin in the questions. So the first question is uh, from these are groups from students of PICT Pune. So they have this question that about the scriptures that um, some people say that our scriptures are only mental speculation. What offense people are committing by producing scriptures in the wrong manner like that? Uh, wrong translation or wrong purport, which leads to think people that scriptures are not good. Okay. There are, I would say, three different situations over here. See, there is reading scripture, there is reading from scripture, and there is reading into scripture. So reading scripture means we just read the book, and then, okay, this is what it contains. Then reading from scripture would mean that we, while reading, we zero in on specific sections and then we try to understand, okay, how, the, how is the section relevant now? What does it mean practically? So there is, uh, and then reading into scripture means that we take our conceptions and push them or thrust them onto scripture. That is where the big problem comes up. So somebody who wants to justify a particular thing, they might say that this is what the scripture teaches. So there was some person who told Srila Prabhupada that Swamiji, I don't know the verse, but I've heard that the Bhagavad Gita says that whatever path you follow, whatever you do, you will come to me, will, will attain God. So Prabhupada said that if that is the case, then why does Krishna even have to speak the Gita? So we could say that uh, there are certain interpretations which go against the content of the scripture, what is said over there, they go against the context of the scripture, uh, what, in what context the scripture was spoken. They go against the broader context of the scripture also. That means in the way that scripture was understood in the tradition. So to understand when we talk about offense, see the idea is that if certain books have certain prestige in society, then people may want to use that prestige, write piggyback on that prestige to get prestige for their own writings. Or suppose, uh, say, we have a speaker who is speaking in pure Sanskrit. And say most of the audience doesn't understand Sanskrit. Say the audience understands English or Hindi. And say the speaker doesn't understand English or Hindi. So then there's a translator in between. So that the speaker speaks in English. And then the translator is meant to know, sorry, the speaker speaks in Sanskrit. The translator should know Sanskrit. And the translator should know English. And the translator translates what the speaker has spoken in Sanskrit into what has been spoken, what into, into a language and a way that the audience can understand. Now, suppose this translator starts speaking something entirely different from what the speaker is speaking. So the speaker is say, uh, talking, say that uh, you know, if Krishna says that man mana bhava mad bhakto, uh, Fix your mind on me, become my devotee. So, so sorry, the, the speaker is speaking a point like this that, okay, Krishna says in the Gita, that is, uh, fix your mind on me and become my devotee. And then the, tra then the person who is translating is, is uh, actually, we, we don't have to fix the mind on Krishna. We have to fix the mind on the unborn within Krishna. Now, what is the problem over here? Now, if the translator wants to give their own talk, they can do that. You know, they can arrange a program, invite people. Whoever wants to come and hear, they can hear. So, and they can speak at that time. So everybody, we live in a free world. Everybody can express their thoughts. We can't stop that. But if somebody is claiming to represent or present somebody else's thoughts, the translator is there to translate what the speaker is saying. 
So if the translator instead starts speaking something which is different for uh, or even opposite to what the speaker is speaking, then it is a problem. So this is not being fanatical. We can say that we all have the we all have intelligence and we will try to understand scripture using our intelligence, which is okay. We all are meant to apply the, our intelligence, but at the same time we can't go against the literal word of the scripture. Simultaneously, we can't go against uh, uh, the whole tradition in which scripture has been understood and suddenly understand it in a different way. So I would say that kind of misrepresentation where the where the translator speaks something different from the speaker, that is where the problem comes up. And if say none of nobody in the audience understands what the speaker is speaking because they don't know Sanskrit, then nobody would even know that something wrong has been done over here. It's only if somebody else who also knows both languages is in the audience, they'll say, hey, what you're speaking is wrong. So that's why sometimes it's a, uh, those who are uh, res full responsible for presenting the tradition properly, they may have to criticize or at least point out that certain translations are not certain translations, certain commentaries are not doing the right thing. So that's what uh, I would say. And this is where things become misrepresented. So what we we live in a world where people have freedom. So we can't really control who will do what. But what we can definitely do is focus on. Um, we can focus on trying to see not just how well a person is speaking, but how much are they living spiritually and how much are they part of a Gita tradition. Because the Gita has been heard and understood for a long time and same applies to other scriptures also. So basically, uh, that's how there are checks and balances within the tradition. There is Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. So if you consider Guru to be like the translator, then the Guru has to also explain Shastra. That means Srila Prabhupada, he gives the Sanskrit of the Bhagavad Gita also. He gives a word for word translation and he gives his purport. So he lets people see what he, what is the text that he's reading. And he also explains how he's reading from that text in the contextual application. So there is Guru, there is Sadhu, so, so, and there is Shastra. Shastra is the basically like the, the speaker who's, whose words are being translated. Guru will act like the translator. And Sadhus are the community of spiritual teachers who are aware. So there, there is the innate system of checks and balances and if that system of checks and balances is followed, then mistranslations and misrepresentations can be avoided. Does it answer the question? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you. So the next question Prabhu is from uh, the students of uh, Rajikiya Engineering College Bijinor near Jamshedpur. So the students are asking question that, which is uh, about the scriptures. They're saying that the scriptures are written long ago, uh, according to that time. So now the things are changing and are the scriptures not changing its relevance? Why are the scriptures not changing uh, themselves according to be relevant today, according to the present situation? And uh, there is a second part of this question that, you know, if, certain scriptures do change uh, or some people are changing then how can we be sure that no one is adding any details about that which are present already in the vedas you know so how is the details not being changed so how do we ensure that okay so when scriptures were spoken long ago uh, how are they relevant now yeah, that's an important question. So I would say two, three things in this context. First is that any book, we cannot, for it to be relevant, there has to always be certain amount of contextualization so that it can be applied properly. So for example, if, uh, if somebody writes something, even in today's world, Somebody writes about say how democracy is conducted in America. And then they say these are the checks and balances we have to take care of. So we can't apply them right now in India because India has a different system. India is different. The population is much more. The systems for accountability might be different. 
so any book no set of guidelines can be literally applied in all situations no laws can be applied literally why otherwise if the laws could be applied literally there would be no need for lawyers and there's no need for debating any case that <clears throat> Although, if you look at the law codes and the law books, they are incredibly detailed and they need to be significantly detailed and still they don't really address everything that needs to be addressed because real life is complicated, real life is messy and in the complications of real life, okay, <clears throat> how do we apply? Say there might be a rule against uh, that if somebody commits a murder, they are they are to be penalized, which is true, which is valid, which is right, valid. But then if they're committing murder and for self-defense, then what happens at that time? So now how do you define self-defense? Do you consider it that the person, the victim has to be injured to indicate that uh, the other person was about to kill them? So, so um, maybe the other person was just trying to talk with them and this person thought they were threatening. How do we really know whether the other person had an intent to murder? whether this other person actually fought in self-defense or they used to this as an excuse. There are so many subtleties and that's why court cases require, uh, there, there are both sides, uh, law, lawyers and there are, there, are, there are presentations on both sides and then both say, okay, this is the law applicable over, this is law applicable over here. And then after that, a particular legal code can be applied. The idea here is that taking any set of guidelines and applying it in real life, it is, it is complicated. So, dharmasya tattvam nihitam guhayam mahajano yenagatha sapantha. So, although dharma is based in shastra, but the principles of dharma, to apply them, we have to turn towards mahajanas. Those who have internalized those principles and those who are trying to live those principles in their own lives. So, now, <clears throat> for the scriptures to be relevant, the scriptures themselves don't need to change. However, how they are to be applied, that understanding has to be got from those who are the living teachers of the tradition. So living teachers of the tradition, what do we mean by that? So basically when scripture is to be applied, uh, we need to consider three questions. So first is, if there is a particular state what did this mean in its original context? I'll show you a diagram here. This is called a ladder of abstraction. This is a standard uh, uh, intellectual tool used for understanding any, uh, any literature. And so, so, so this is a ladder of abstraction. The ladder of abstraction means that at the bottom of this ladder, there are specifics. There are specific details. At the top of this ladder, there are universal principles. So for example, now, um, if uh, any kind of education has to be there, one has to keep moving up and down the ladder of abstraction. So if I start a class by saying that today, I'll talk about the uh, demographic trends in the population of polar bears in Siberia or in Alaska. Say, how does that matter to me? If you're interested in polar bears, you might find that interesting. That is specific details. It can be interesting, but it's not immediately relevant. But then I say, based on those demographic trends, I will uh, talk about how real and grave climate change is. And then we will look at India and then we'll see how that applies. So what happens is at the bottom of the ladder of abstraction, there are specifics. At the top of the ladder, there are universal principles. So when I talk about say specifics of the demographic trends of polar bears in, in Siberia. So this is at the bottom. Then that, what that the, at the top will be, sorry, okay. At the top, mm -hmm. so this is at the bottom specifics. At the top are universal principles. So, okay, global cha uh, climate change is an issue. We will see how great the issue is. And then when I bring it down to our side, this is specifics in our times. So in our times means specifics in our situation. So, okay, how grave is the problem for us in India? So, so for any talk, 
we, it, for any teaching to be relevant, we need to go up and down this ladder of abstraction. So scriptures give us specifics at that particular time. So to understand how it is relevant, we don't need to change the scriptures, but we need to use this ladder of abstraction. So at that time, so the first question I say is, what did this principle mean at that time? So what is what did this principle mean at that time? So for example, there was a principle of dowry. So is it discriminatory? Is it uh, exploitative? What did this mean at that time? Uh, so the meaning was that at that time, property would normally be inherited by the by the sons. So what do we the get, women get from their families? So that so actually the dowry would be considered to be the property of the women. It would be the jeweler, jewelries and other things which would be there with the woman and although they would be in the house of the husband but they would be with her and she would pass it on to her daughter so it, it, the basic point principle was financial security for the woman the principle is she, she doesn't get any inheritance so she will have some financial security that is the principle now how can that financial security be provided now so is dowry relevant now is dowry essential today well now it has become perverted where rather than being a financial security for the woman it becomes a financial demand at the time of marriage. So what was given as a gift has now become a demand. So the way it is applied now is misapplied. So then how do we have financial security? Maybe in, in today's world, before women get married, they get educated, they have a job, they have some job experience. Even if they decide they don't want to work after marriage, but they have that experience, they have that option to fall back on. That's the way they may have financial security. So, so, the, so this is how we need to apply scripture. So here I've given another example. Say in the Mah in the Ramayana, you know, Shurpankashi incited Ram Ravan by describing explicitly the beauty of Sita. So till then Ravan was a little reluctant to antagonize Ram, but once he heard about Sita's beauty, he became agitated. So this is a specific. We say, okay, how is it relevant? So the universal principle is that people can use our weaknesses to manipulate us. So Ravana had the weakness of lust, and Shurpanka used it to manipulate us. So we could say, what is the specific application in our times that, you know, nowadays the ad industry, the porn industries, they use sexually explicit images to, exp to sell their products for us to mint money. So this is how now there might not be any specific reference either to ad industries or porn industry in scripture, mm -hmm. but the principle is there. So this ladder of abstraction is used by scriptural teachers to explain things in a way that is accessible. So when Srila Prabhupada was in America and he was asked by a hippie, uh, hippies were people who used to take drugs and other things. So they asked Swami, what is the happiness of the spiritual world like? So Srila Prabhupada replied, it is like an ocean of LSD. Uh, LSD is a drug which is, which is common at that time. So and they, these people, they were to take drugs and go high. So now if we look for an ocean of LSD, we may not find that specific phrasing in scripture. Because the idea of LSD is not there. But what Prabhupada is doing, now there might be descriptions of how, you know, it's uh, thousands of times the happiness of liberation. It is millions of times the happiness of heavens. It is, it is millions and millions of times the happiness of even winning over the whole earth. There are desire fulfilling trees and there are um, so many things. Now that may not seem relevant today. So there are specific descriptions say that the, the happiness of uh, us, the happiness of liberation is thousands of times the uh, happiness of heavens. So now this is specific. But what is the universal principle over there? The universal principle is that actually it's immense. The happiness is far, far greater than what we normally conceive as our sources of pleasure. So what so Prabhupada is taking that principle that that happiness is far greater than the our normal sources of pleasure and Prabhupada is giving a specific application. Okay, your source of pleasure you think is is uh, LSD, then this is thousands of times more than LSD. So uh, it's like an ocean of LSD. So basically, scripture stays relevant because scriptural teachers they may never specify the idea of a ladder of abstraction, but this is what is done to translate specifics from another tradition or from another situation to specifics in our situations. That's how scripture stays relevant. And now while doing this, how can we ensure that, uh, that there are no significant changes that are made? 
Well, firstly, again, we have to go back to the system of checks and balances. Look at what scripture is originally saying. That is the Shastra. Then try to make, understand whether what the guru is, is teacher is saying makes sense. And then also connect with uh, sadhus. If something doesn't make sense, ask others. So this is the innate, uh, there's a check and balance system within the tradition itself. So that way the meaning is protected. While, while maintaining, while ensuring that relevance is also established. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Prabhu, beautifully described Prabhuji that ladder. So the next question is Prabhuji relevant to that only. Uh, uh, because we see in the previous times there were lots of uh, rituals which were followed. And uh, as you quoted a couple of that here. So the next question is from the students of VSSUT Burla, Orissa. They are asking that uh, during uh, previous times, uh, there were prathas like uh, sati uh, and which uh, you know, the women were burning their themselves after the husband's death and uh, bali pratha where the animals are put on sacrifice in the altar of uh, Lord as Kali. So is this there in the scriptures? So firstly, sati was an option, never an imposition. What do I mean by this? Sati was something which the woman could choose. And you might say, why would somebody want to choose also like that? Why would somebody want to die uh, just because their spouse has died, their husband has died? So first of all, uh, in the Vedic times, it was implicitly understood that death is not the end. Death is not like the period at the end of a sentence. Death is like a comma. So. So unless that fundamental point is understood, many of the either decisions by the characters or many of the rituals that were practiced at that time, they will just not make sense. So, you know, when we look at the decisions that people are making, we can't just look in the immediate context. Okay, this was, uh, we can't just look at that action or that decision. How could anyone do like this? We have to look at the broader context. And broader context doesn't refer to the broader situation. Broader, ref, broader context refers to the overall worldview that people have. So this is an example from a different context say, of killing. Suppose we are watching a movie and then somebody is sitting at their home and they're eating something peaceful and suddenly somebody just bursts into their door and they start shooting them. And then they say, hey, this is too brutal. Are these people terrorists? Why are they killing a person who is just peacefully in their home? But then maybe if we watch the movie, we come to know that this person who was eating very peacefully was actually a terrorist. And he has killed many, many people. And the po people who burst in were actually the police or the soldiers. And because this person was so brutal, had killed so many people and had plans to kill so many people in the future, that the government had given a shoot at sight order. So therefore, they didn't ask any questions and they killed him. So if you look just at the immediate context, we might get the opposite conclusion of the actual. We might think the terrorist is ordinary, is a good person and the police are the terrorists. But the reality is this so-called good person is a terrorist and the police are actually doing something to establish law and order. So I'm just giving this, this doesn't apply specifically here. But my point is looking at the bigger context can radically change our perspective of why something is done. So Sati, why was it done? Because at that time, women understood that, that we are all on a multi-life journey of spiritual evolution. And if their husband is virtuous and they have both lived a life of virtue, then they could continue that relationship in a future life. Now developing relationships is remarkably complicated. And we see that in today's world, wherein one of the biggest fears for people is, I mentioned about top 10 fears uh, in, my, in, a, in the previous QA, that one of them is the fear of terrorists, and one of them is the fear of rejection. When people form, try to form a relationship, they propose to someone, or anyway, even if they get married, uh, still they have the fear that my spouse or my better half, my significant other may leave me and go away. So this fear of rejection. So relationships are incredibly complicated. So the idea was that 
at that time they they thought that there are ways in which we could continue the relationship from this life to the next life so how could we do that so it was said that if a woman dies in the same funeral pyre in which her husband is dying then by the higher arrangements within the universe by which the soul is taken to the next body the woman will go to the same situation where the similar situation where the husband is and the woman will reunite with the husband so basically the same relationship could be continued and so that so now especially if they were living in a dharmic context in a virtuous context then a woman would see that her fate or her destiny could be continued auspiciously if she maintained that same relationship and that's why they would do this so this was this was a the basis so it was not it was not we could say brutality that a woman was forced to be burnt but she chose that because she she would prefer to continue that same relationship in the next life and because there was a close bond between the husband and the wife and the wife would even feel that living without that relationship is is difficult so now the point i make it's option and we see this so many places in scripture that after pandu was killed he had two queens pandu died because of a curse he had two queens madri and kunti now both of them wanted to go sati <coughs> but then madri requested um, sati that sorry she requested kunti that you are you are older you are wiser you are more experienced somebody has to be there to take care of our children so you can do a much better job than what i can do also when pandu departed he was desiring to be with me so let me go in the next life and fulfill that uh, desire so she requested and kunti consented so that's how it was now in the mahabharat itself we have satyavati she doesn't go sati when um, when her husband shantanu passes away when the rama and when dashrath passes away none of the queens go sati kai kai kaushalya sumitra all of them are still there so it was an option and it was chosen by some women in some situations it was never an imposition but over time in this world everything tends to degrade and it requires continuous effort to maintain anything this we easily understand for say machines if you have machine it requires regular maintenance but the, the same principle applies to mechanisms it applies to systems it applies to say social structures even rituals which are there rituals are meant for a particular purpose but when they get degenerated means what happens sometimes the ritual itself is done in a wrong way or degeneration can happen in two ways one is that it is done in a wrong way or it is done for a wrong purpose mm. so wrong purpose means over a period of time as marriage became more and more commercialized it became not so much of a two partners coming together for a life of virtue and dharma it came became a financial transaction so then a uh, a widow would be seen as a liability in the family and then sometimes women were forced to be uh, to go into sati and that was ghastim and when that happened there was vehement opposition to that by some, in some quarters and when the british came to india they considered this one of the most barbaric practices in india and i and i agree it was barbaric but unfortunately what happened was when the british chose to ban it there are some hindus who tried to claim that this is our right how dare you stop us from doing this this is our culture this is our right and then it was done more assertively now there are um, i can send you links for books on the history of sati which actually show that it was never widely practiced and certainly it was never imposed the way it was it has been portrayed not that it was never imposed but the first of all it was not widely practiced and when it was practiced it was more voluntary than mandatory but uh, there are many things which became distorted in india after the british rule here we don't want to make the britain britain like a whipping boy for problems in hinduism yes there are problems no doubt but what happened when the british came, when the moguls came to india they may have destroyed temples but they did not interfere too much with the structures okay this is how your family you manage your economy you manage your family you manage your villages 
the villages remained self sufficient as long as the muslims got their taxes they were they were enough but the british they had the idea of what what rudyard kipling called the white man's burden they felt that the rest of the world is uncivilized and it is the responsibility of the white man to civilize the rest of humanity so uh, there was india is a big country and it is only on very few occasions that there was even one central ruler for all of india it is divided into many different kingdoms and there was no one central religious authority there was shankaracharya was there madhavacharya was there these acharyas they had their influences but there was no one single religious authority so basically religious practices were diverse manu in his manu samhita himself says that you know he has given these codes but if a uh, assembly of wise people feel that any of the codes are not applicable in the particular situation they can make the necessary changes so he says that specifically there so there was a lot of diversity there but somehow what the british because they wanted to administer india and they wanted to impose like a universal legal system so they tried to find which good book and which its practices they could use so they took manu samhita and they centralized it but manu samhita itself was not used everywhere and even it was used its use was adapted in many places so there was diversity in the mahabharat itself we see that uh, when madri was to be married bishma went to madra which is considered by some to be in south india now madras or chennai so when he went to shalya the who was his her brother so he said that in our in our community when a woman gets married it is the boy's side who gives gift to the girl's side so this was almost opposite of the dowry system and bishma said yes i am aware of that that's why i brought lots of gifts for you and he gave those gifts so there was a there was cultural diversity and that was recognized and accepted so basically a sati was a part of the tradition and i explain why it was a part but it was never imposition and it the way it is portrayed as a barbaric practice that was because of degeneration and even the degeneration was exaggerated by the british when they tried to impose one system on all over india and then they try to demonize by saying how terrible the system is okay thank you yes prabhu that uh, answers the part of the question which was about sati uh, there are concepts about bali also so nar bali and animal bali so how do we understand that so to understand what is the principle of sacrifice so now human sacrifice can seem much more shocking than animal sacrifice and there are references to that also so first thing we need to understand is that the as i said india is a huge country where the culture existed not just in india but in many other parts of the world also so isn't a, so it was not just one monolithic practice everywhere so like i said if you are to understand human sacrifice also we have to look at the context not just the content there is a bigger view of life and its purpose the bigger view of life and its purpose was that <clears throat> see in today's world death is considered to be the end you know you live only once that's quite a common saying in today's world and yes it, if it is used to inspire people to take life seriously and do the things that are important for them that's good but from a philosophical perspective that's not the truth we don't live only once so this perspective whether we live only once or whether we where life is a continuation across many lifetimes that radically changes how things are perceived so whenever there was a sacrifice what is the principle of sacrifice that whatever offers us pleasure we offer that very thing for a higher cause so now different people have different levels of consciousness and what offers people pleasure so that very thing it is so for some people you know that there, there is there is food there are grains which are put into sacrifice there is ghee that is put into sacrifice there are fruits that are put into sacrifice there is silk that is put into sacrifice by sacrifice i am referring here specifically to the uh, principle of fire sacrifice specifically to the practice of fire sacrifice but uh, the idea over it is is similar for any sacrifice the idea is that whatever offers us pleasure whatever is considered valuable for us we offer that very thing for a higher cause and this principle of sacrifice is there in human society everywhere 
that without like say when somebody goes to fight for the country when the country is being attacked now they're sacrificing they could live comfortably in their homes having their routine jobs but they go to the battlefront that's a sacrifice and that sacrifice is for a higher cause and if you look only from a limited perspective you are living at home and you're going and fighting with people whom you never seen you're fighting with people which you don't know why are you fighting it may make no sense but look at the bigger picture you are a part of a country and the country is to be defended now of course even national patriotic wars become politicalized and not every war is good but the principle of sacrificing what is what is one's own for a higher cause that is noble so now in the vedic context it was understood that when sacrifices are performed they, they, there is as i said like from the person's ordinary perspective okay i am here my family and my job are here i am leaving and going there why am i going there at the border to fight because you don't just belong to this unit of a family you belong to a bigger unit that is the country and sometimes the belonging to the bigger unit of the country may may call upon you to do certain things which normally you would not do normally if somebody is a responsible person they would not endanger their lives unnecessarily but here it's necessary because you are belonging to a higher whole bigger whole so similarly there is an understanding that just as we can we may the duty because we belong to a higher whole may require the subordination of the duty uh, because of the other smaller whole that we are a part of smaller unit that we are part of so similarly the cosmos is envisioned at a bigger level that we we belong to the universe and in the universe there is the terrestrial or the earthly level and at the celestial which is the level of the devatas and then there is a transcendental level which is the at the level of the supreme lord bhagwan so now there is a in, uh, because we belong to that higher level there has to be interaction with that higher level also devan bhavayata nena te deva bhavayantu vah parasparam bhavayanta shreya parama vapsyata so there is a interaction at a higher level now when this interaction with the higher level is happening sometimes it may seem strange from our perspective so you could eat ghee you could eat silk you could eat grains you could wear silk why are you putting all that in fire so the medium of exchange is different in different situations so devanam paramo vishnu avamo agni tadantara sarva devata so in the rigvedic scriptures it is said that among the devatas vishnu is considered the highest and agni is considered the lowest lowest not in the sense of being least powerful but lowest in the sense of most accessible so when a fire is properly in, invoked through mantras in a sacred context then it, that fire is considered to be a manifestation of the fire god agni and the fire god acts as a medium by which what we are offering goes to the goes to the goes to the heavenly domain to the devatas so the medium of this exchange we might find it unbelievable you know you're putting it in the fire and it's going it's becoming ashes well that's only at the level of our perception there is a bigger context happening so there is a exchange happening in that bigger context <clears throat> just like if we have to pay some taxes to the government now we might go to a a particular maybe a bank or something and we might take a pile of notes and we give it to the bank and all we get is a receipt in return somebody doesn't know what's happening is you put so much money and you just got one piece of paper what is the use of it or if you consider digital currency somebody might take a huge huge suitcase of notes and they give it in the bank and the bank gives them just one card and somebody the onlooker he says you have been cheated over here you are wasting money what is this one card as compared to that whole suitcase of money but no there are different mediums of exchange and if one understands the systems that are there in place then one can make sense of the mediums of exchange so sacrifice was basically a way of interacting between the celestial and between the terrestrial and celestial earthly and heavenly levels so specifics of how it was done would vary so different things could be sacrificed generally uh, the sacrifice of the food items in some cases people who eat animals uh, they are anyway going to kill animals so let them do that in a religiously regulated context so that was how it was done 
so that there's some amount of regulation. Human sacrifice was extremely rare. It was considered, uh, even at that time, it was something which was done by people who are you could say, not at all spiritually evolved. So when it was done, it was rare and it was never considered something which was, at least the human sacrifice was rare, done by people who were not at all evolved. So we understand that just like in today's world, there are people who are quite thoughtful and evolved and regulated. And there are people who are completely unregulated and uh, quite, uh, quite um, degraded. So, re so religious rituals at that time in the past, they are more in today's world like technology than like religion or spirituality. What do I mean by technology? That by see, just like if we consider now there are terrorists. So or there might be a terror, the state which sponsors terrorism. Now they have their army and they have their scientists. So a st one, one country might be very law, international law abiding and contributing to the overall body of scientists, overall body of the overall world's well-being. Another might be disrupting the world's well-being. But both of them will have their scientists. And their scientists will develop various weapons. So in the way past, rituals, at one level, they were a part of religion, where connecting with higher realities. At another level, they were like technology. So even people who were demoniac, they would also have their Brahmins, they would also do, they would also have their priests, and they would also do rituals. So say the priests who were chanting prayers for Ravana's victory over Ram. Now those were paid priests. They were not very spiritually evolved priests who were devoted to the Supreme. So they were more like technologists. They were more like say today's scientists. Say a scientist might be with a working with a rogue actor a taste state which sponsors terrorism, but they are doing their job. So whom they are doing it for, that person may use or abuse their what they are doing. So there were people who were using those sacrifices for ulterior motives. So Jarasandha was going to perform a sacrifice where he was going to kill uh, or a hundred kings whom, whom he had arrested. And through that, he hoped to gain extraordinary power. Now, Krishna went with Bhima and uh, Arjuna and he stopped that and he, said, and he released all the kings and not only released them but reinstated them, gave them all respect and gave them their kingdoms back. So when we see certain things in scripture, it's a very important principle to understand that everything in scripture is not the teaching of scripture. That some things when they're, they're in scripture, they're describing how things, what things were done at that time. That doesn't necessarily mean this is what you have to do right now. There is something which is descriptive in scripture and there is something which is prescriptive. So, so I explained till now what animal sacrifices and human sacrifices. So human sacrifices are usually done by people who are under evolved, very unevolved, degraded and uh, animal sacrifices, even when they were done in that context, if the animal would die, if it died in a religious context, then that animal would evolve to a, a higher level, either get a human body or, or get some other auspicious destination because the whole thing was done in an auspicious context. And even then, if you look at the tradition, there is, it was, even when statements are there in scripture where animals were to be sacrificed, it was mentioned that there are alternatives. So Madhacharya, for example, quotes from scriptures to explain how instead of killing an actual animal, one can make a grain effigy of an animal. Hmm? and use use grains to make a goat grains make grains to sh in the shape of a goat and then kill that means cut cut off its head so there were alternatives to uh, that kind of sacrifice so people who are interested in eating meat or people who are in a society where that kind of sacrifice is considered considered prestigious they might do it but those who are not attached to those things there were alternatives for them so sacrifice so i'll summarize the answer Sacrifice itself is a universal principle where we sacrifice for a higher cause that which is valuable for us. Now, and so we had to look at the bigger context, not just what is done in this context, but at the national level or at the universal level. And there are certain sacrifices which were done, which are not recommended, which are done by people who were degraded, like animal, like especially human sacrifice. 
and animal sacrifice when it was done is also it was going to lead the, uh, to the evolution of the animal and there are alternatives for that so in today's world these kind of sacrifices are not at all recommended and especially in Kal in kali it is said that one should avoid animal sacrifice certainly human sacrifice is out of question and it is the sacrifice of our consciousness through the chanting of the holy names that is recommended for this age okay yes any other questions yes prabhu so uh, thank you for answering that previous one now uh, as we understood about the women's uh, you know sati so that leads to um, you know one more follow up question that is asked by the students of iit khadakpur and also a case study that has been given by the students of isc bangalore so i like to go through that so uh, that is fine that um, sati is relevant you know during that time but uh, was it meant only for the woman why not the husband if the woman is dying before the uh, uh, before the husband does the husband also enter inside the fire now this is the question and also a little addition to that uh, is uh, uh, is a case study so this is a case study of a student who is in isc bangalore he says that topics like equality of men and women are are they still valid or can they be applied as it is he says recently i had a discussion with one of my friends on this topic she had posted one picture of a lady with minimal clothes with being depicted as lord shiva i politely asked her that we should not mutate lord according to our thoughts to which she said that it is not lord shiva but just a girl meditating like shiva her picture is also having a crescent moon on her head i tried to explain her that such sensual depiction of demigods is not good my friend is in general a spiritual girl but and worships krishna daily but he said that a girl can wear whatever she wants and that men and women are equal i tried to explain her about the spiritual equality versus material differences to which she did not agree what could be said in such a situations well there's a lot in that uh, question i would say there are three different questions so uh, let's look at first gender equality mm -hmm. okay this is a delicate subject and uh, in fact if you want to say there is the first world and there is the third world or there is the western world and there is the eastern world whether it is india or china or even the far east like uh, like indonesia or other parts of the world also so generally in the western world uh, that women's equality women are equal to men this is accepted in principle whether it is practiced in real life there is there are questions in in the eastern world even now it is understood that it is still considered women are subordinate to men and women should uh, women should serve men so now this is a difference and there is a lot of conflicts that come because of this so let's understand first of all that the way we are living today is very different from the way humanity has lived throughout most of history mm -hmm. and some people when they talk about gender equality they try to portray that as if oh women have been exploited throughout history by men and now only women are getting their rights and they are they are able to uh, have some freedom have some growth and have a life well that's a mis that's a monstrous misrepresentation of reality actually it is not that throughout history men were exploiting women rather throughout history life is always very difficult you know we could talk about say re remote times when there was a, like a golden age in in the vedic context or something like that but even then demons would appear the point is that human existence is difficult and within this difficult human existence people come together and form relationships in ways that are sustainable so the man women coming together is it's of course there is sexual attraction over there but along with that that is a sustainable way by which reproduction happens and the species moves on so among all species uh, we could say that in the human the human progeny has the longest period for caring 
in some species the bird just lay the eggs and they hatch the eggs and the bird let start flying in some case in fish the the offspring may not even know who their parents are because they, they just go wherever they are there are different degrees of care required but the human offspring requires cares for years and even before when the woman is pregnant she requires care so a man and a woman to come together and having certain roles in human society that has been an arrangement that has worked well if we consider now uh, how dangerous life is now we are of course experiencing some amount of danger because of the pandemic but human history if we see uh, there have been dangers constantly there have been this flood this famine this invasion this problem mm. yeah i was reading recently about european history and then there is a there is a description that there was a king under his rule uh, he said that their country enjoyed an unparalleled period of peace for 35 years so 35 years without any not that others didn't invade but they were not defeated they were not plundered because he repelled them so just 35 years to be peaceful without any invaders coming was exceptional it is not the norm so what we were experiencing since the second world war till the pandemic came about this is not typical of human history human history is filled with adversities and where um, women exploited by men well not exactly there were certain exploitative men who exploited men and women together there were there were barbaric rulers there were invaders and and they were exploited so everybody was exploited by them and life was so difficult that even men didn't have time to exploit women you know how are we going to get food how are we going to raise the crops how are we going to take care of the kids how are we going to survive men and women cooperated as well as they could to counter the potential catastrophe that like, potential disasters that life could bring upon them at any time so this is how man and woman survived life is always difficult but things changed over the last century or so maybe a little earlier where in the past women uh, society was structured in such a way that women could play uh, have their gender roles and men could have their gender roles and women were happy in their gender roles why because they were contributing in a valuable way uh, but after industrialization social structure changed in fact the whole word the idea of uh, inferiority complex as a psychological term it has come in a post industrial society people in the past were not having that why because in the post industrialized society because of social changes certain certain definitions of success became glamorized so for example somebody who can earn a lot of money and get wealth and power and fame that became the definition of success for everyone so in the past there were priests there were workers there were landlords there were different kinds of people and everybody had their definition of success we could say everybody wants money everybody wants fame but there are different degrees for it and people uh, people would pursue their definitions of success but in the post industrialized society what happened was it, to some extent the male definition of success started being seen as the sole definition of success and women also started aspiring for that now there are other factors also because in the past if people were living in a joint family then if something happened to the man there would be broader community to broader family or community to take care of the woman but when people trans started traveling and there was the joint family gave it to the nuclear family something happened to the man and the woman would have to take step forward who will take care of the children so women also recognize that they needed to extend themselves beyond the traditional gender roles so that's how and especially in the second world war in america that was the time when first world war and second world war when large number of men went to the war then women came forward and they started doing many of the things which were earlier thought only men could do it women can't do it when women started doing it and then even after the men came back from war said women said we'll continue doing it and that's how things have spread so the gender roles which were distinct so are man and women equal well it depends what you mean by equality mm? it's uh, can uh, 
man beget a child no and you know begetting a child is a privilege it's a new life that is coming into the world and it is brought into the world by a woman so that is a, a motherhood is a privilege and a blessing that a woman has women all also they are they are quite emotionally intuitive and they are very well equipped to take care of babies but that doesn't mean that is all that a woman has to do but the point is trying to impose one definition of success on everyone men and women that is just unnatural this doesn't mean that women have to be dominated and exploited by men not at all but the point is that uh, in the western world where there is a hyper emphasis on man woman equality quite often the fertility rate is going down alarmingly and much of western civilization in terms of caucasians the whites their rate of reproduction is such that uh, such that civilization may die out soon that not enough women are having children and why because women think i have to have a career and if i have a career then uh, i'll have to take a break from it and then if i take a break from it then uh, i will fall back in the competition my career will not grow so why should i have a child so and unfortunately many women they as they grow older 30 they go beyond say 40 45 50 55 they feel very lonely there is a need to nurture which is there in every human being but especially very strongly there in in women and that is not being addressed so there are various societal consequences that have come about so gender equality in the sense that everybody deserves equal protection everybody deserves equal opportunity for doing something meaningful in life that is something which is accepted at the same time gender equality in the sense that women should be doing everything that men are doing or should men be doing everything that women are doing say most truck drivers are men should we have equal percentage of women truck drivers most mine workers who dig underground are men do we want equal percentage of women in that no the point is that there are in the scandinavian countries they try to give all possible opportunities at right from upbringing men and women they were seen to be you can give them opportunity to do whatever they want and they found that even when women and men had the complete freedom to choose whatever they wanted more women, men went toward engineering and more women went toward say professions which involve more relationships caring so women go more into nursing there are a few male nurses but men are more women are much much more in that so women are more interested in people men are more interested in things now this is a very broad generalization and there will always be many exceptions but broadly speaking women would like to go into if they are given the freedom they would like to go into fields where they can have relationships they can have they can nurture they can connect emotionally men on the other hand would like to have deal with read with things you know men would video games are much more common among boys then girls because uh, girls would like to interact with someone they might be on social media more and people put their pictures on facebook so we can't deny the biological and the psychological differences that are there that come with each gender so trying to deny that is is artificial it's it's uh, it's unnatural and it can be socially damaging also so now how exactly in today's world uh the gender roles are going to be applied that's very complicated in the spiritual context we understand that man and woman both are meant to come together for spiritual evolution so how best that can be done that will vary but that's a brief history of gender equality in not just in india but even in the west in the past people more or less stuck to traditional gender roles although there are a few exceptions here and there when situation called for it but in general the people stuck to the gender roles but in today's changing world how much uh, people should conform to traditional gender roles how much uh, they need to acknowledge current realities and prepare themselves how much what a, what an individual wants to pursue that needs to be facilitated all this has to be carefully decided so this is something like i talk about the ladder of abstraction 
So we have to understand the principle and see how that principle can be applied in today's world. So does it answer your question? Yes, Prabhu. Very nicely. Um, so there is a, a follow-up question for the previous uh, aspect of uh, the Bali Pratha. So there are uh, two concepts. Um, so one is about uh, mediating. Both are actually about mediating. So there is one question and one case study. So I'll go through both of that. Okay, I think there are two parts or uh, two points in the previous question that I didn't answer, which okay. you mentioned that. If you want, I'll quickly answer that. Yes, for sure. So the first point was that was a reverse true with respect to dowry. Would the man also go well? This idea that man and woman need to be equal in every respect. That is something which is a modern, uh, modern notion. The idea is that they are different. So traditionally in the traditional society, the, the, when marriage would happen, usually the man would be somewhat older than the woman. The idea was the man could be more mature and the man could lead the family that leading doesn't mean dominating. So in the traditional society, the man was considered to be the leader and the woman follows the man. And of course the man follows the spiritual teacher and the children follow the woman. That's how the family was. So a woman also needs protection much more than a man does. So it's not just in general, but specifically also during the period of pregnancy and child rearing. So in general, a woman would be defenseless and she would also feel emotionally isolated. So Sati, Whenever it was done, it was more for a woman than a man. A man, a man. It it is at least in a traditional society, and even in modern society to some extent, it is relatively much easier for a man to live on after the breakage of a relationship than for a woman to live on, because society was structured in a particular way at that time. So yes, it was not the reverse was not there, because there are other factors involved over there. And uh, for a uh, man, if the man is doing virtuous activities, then the woman will follow that man. So that was the way that relationship was structured. Now, the other part about say women dressing in a particular way. Well, yes, people can dress the way they want. We can't control them. But then everything that we do, it sends certain messages. So if somebody wants to say dress scantily and then depict that it's like Lord Shiva. Well, we're going to disturb people's minds and uh, we can't control people's reactions. So nowadays it's seen that it's a woman's right to dress however they want. Well, okay. You can say that it's your right, but basically everybody has certain power and everybody needs to use that power in a regulated way. Otherwise there are unwanted consequences. Say if somebody has a lot of money and then they are walking through a dark, lonely street with a lot of money, say uh, maybe hundred dollars, hundred rupees or hundred dollar notes sticking out of their pockets. And then somebody comes and robs them. And then when they are robbed, they go completely to the police and the police say that, you know, why did you have those uh, notes? Uh, uh, protruding out of your pocket. You say, it's my money. I can do whatever I want with it. It's my right. Well, it's not a question of rights over here. Still, it's a crime. Whoever has robbed them, they have to be brought to the, they have to be punished. But the point is the police will say that maybe don't exhibit your money like that. If you exhibit, you're attracting thieves. So, similarly, if a woman flaunts her body, then, you know, if somebody abuses her, that is a crime, no doubt about it. And the abuser has to be punished. But just as uh, you know, having a dollar bills sticking out of one's pocket, send some message and attracts a particular kind of attention. So women dressing in particular ways attracts particular kind of attention. So now in a culture where everybody dresses, uh, uh, dresses in a often dresses in scanty clothes, then somebody dressing that way may not stand out. But in a culture where people don't do like that, if somebody does it like that, that, that stands out. And the nature has given different kinds of power to different people. So men 
are given more physical power. Biologically speaking, um, the male muscles and the male body structure is not normally stronger than the female body structure. Now nature has given the females also power. So within, we could say the male female interaction, lust attracts men through pleasure. Oh, there is so much enjoyment over here. And within the male female attraction, lust allures women through power. Through power. What do I mean by power? It actually has a very heady sense of power that if, if say you come into a room and everybody stops doing what they are doing and look at you. To feel that center of attention, to feel that center of attraction, that is a sense of power. And almost every woman between the ages of 15 to 40, with a little earlier, a little later, that nature gives them that power by which they can attract. They can attract people. So just as a man who has strong biological power, he has to, is expected to regulate the use of that power in a way that civilized society can go on. So similarly, women, they have been given that power to attract by their, by their appearance, by their, by, by their flesh. So they have to use that in a regulated way. So if they want to use that in a regular unregulated way, well, that's going to have consequences, harmful consequences for them, harmful consequences for others. Just like when men abuse their power, there is consequences. So women's power is more subtle. So dressing in uh, scanty clothes, well, we cannot have a policy, moral policing and tell people you can't dress in that way. But we do need to, we can explain that the way we dress, it has consequences. It sends certain kind of messages, in, at least in certain cultures. And it, it's likely to lead to certain consequences. Again, this is not to blame the victim at all. If some, just like if, if somebody is, however a woman is dressed, if a man attacks and abuses a woman, molests a woman, that is the man's problem. But the idea is both man and women need to come together to need to cooperate to avoid um, uh, lust from devastating society. So man has been given the superior physical power by which a man can act as a protector for a woman and a child. And woman has been given that superior power in terms of attraction, say uh, the attract attractive form by which now she can get a protector and then they can live together. So the power has a particular purpose, male power and female power. And if that, per that power is used for that purpose, then that is, that is constructive. Otherwise that power, if it's used for something else, it can have harmful consequences. So that is a quick answer to that question. Yes, you're, you're asking something about sacrifice, annual sacrifice. Yes, Prue, it was very interesting to hear the concept of dollar bills hanging out in today's context. Thank you for that. So the question is, uh, so uh, con continuation of that Bali Patha, because you answered that very nicely. So there are some follow-up questions with that. So one of the question is a question, and second is a case study. So the question is, is there, question is asked by the VSSUT students, Burla, is there any place where uh, it is written in Quran that Muslims should eat beef as a ritual and does our scriptures like Bhagavad Gita etc allow us to eat meat with certain conditions so that part is answered but the first part and uh, a case study regarding the similar aspect the students from GGD they are saying Pune they are saying my friends one of the students my friend who eat meat always say to me that God has made everything then he has made animals also so it's God's choice only that we can eat meat. He did not, if he did not want us to eat meat, then he shouldn't have created one. I have heard answers from many Prabhujis regarding this, but still I'm unable to convince my meat eating friends that there is where I feel defeated. So I want to learn more about it. I want to spread awareness that how it is not good and how we can stop it. Okay. Let's uh, take the second question first. So God has created animals that can be eaten. So if God didn't want us to eat, then he would not make it. Well, <clears throat> I think this God has made is a, once we start taking that argument, it's a slippery slope. Uh, well, we could say that God has through nature even made poison. Are we meant to eat poison also? So just because something is present in nature 
doesn't mean that we have to consume it. And we don't apply that for so many things in life. We don't, uh, if there are toxic fruits, uh, we, don't talk, we don't eat them. So there is some factor apart from God having made it that shapes our decisions. So let's be honest about that. We can't just use God has made it, so we will eat it. Now, uh, what is the other factor? We could say that, okay, that I won't eat, po eat poisonous fruits because they'll kill me. So this other factor is my death. I want to preserve my life. So what are uh, similarly with respect to our dietary choices, what are other factors we could consider? Well, have, are we humans uh, meant to eat meat? Well, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that technically speaking, humans are omnivorous. We can digest meat. Our bodily structures, say for example, we have canine teeth. So we can eat meat. But at the same time, if we look at canine teeth, our canine teeth are nowhere like uh, the canine teeth of lions or tigers. Hmm? So we cannot rip flesh and cut and eat it with our, with our, uh, with our fangs or with our teeth. We, like animals can and for certain meat eating animals for certain uh, uh, for certain uh, like lions and tigers and other carnivorous animals uh, all their teeth are practically like canine teeth they can eat uh, that their body their body is made for that so if we consider we have out of our 32 teeth we have only four are canine teeth and the canine teeth are also not as sharp as anywhere as sharp as the animal teeth, animal, the carnivorous animal's teeth. And apart from that, also, if you look at our digestive system, it is not exactly suited for eating animals, uh, eating flesh. It's much more similar to herbivores than carnivores. So if at all humans are meant to eat meat, let's put it in proportion. There are 32 teeth out of which only four are canine teeth and they're also not like animal canine teeth so yes historically people have been eating meat throughout history but meat was a small portion of human diet sometimes people would hunt animals kill them and eat them but hunting animals requires effort so it is actually only in recent human history and say we could say the past hundred few hundred years or 100 years even in Western society, meat was a luxury item. But now with organized, industrialized slaughterhouses, you know, millions and millions of animals are killed every day. So, so this kind of mass eating of meat, where meat is made accessible through systematic slaughterhouses, uh, that is something which is unprecedented in human history. So, from the perspective of uh, naturality, we are not, we are not, uh, what is the word? It's not that we are going into nature, killing animals that we, uh, that are naturally growing, but rather we are having organized slaughterhouses where animals are killed. And this kind, this is unnatural. The kind of factory farming, Mm. So, actually, factory farm or we could say the factory farming of animals, according to statistics, 200 million animals are killed for food every day. And this doesn't count at all uh, fish and other things. If we consider it's 3 billion animals are killed every day, which if you include fish also. That means almost half of human population we are killing every day. This is unprecedented in human history. This is unnatural. And the amount of pain that animals go through when they are living in factory farms, that's horrible. So we have to ask ourselves, if we are using nature justification, yes, we can eat, eat, well then eat it the way it is in nature. No in very small quantity, not by using human intelligence and human technology and channeling human brutality, the worst part of our human side to actually 
make life living hell for animals throughout their life and then slaughter them so industrialized killing of animals is is barbaric this is there's nothing like this in human history so i talk this is a second factor so first is i talk from our biological structure point of view small eating from the historical evolution point of view what we are doing is unprecedented then even from is unprecedented not in the positive sense but in the unprecedentedly barbaric from a third perspective we can look at our own conscience and our we could say our gut feeling say in nature there are fruits and um, other vegetarian food to be eaten and there are animals to be eaten are the two really equivalent say say if in future you have a family and uh, you have kids and then in your kid comes back from home and comes back from school and says tomorrow we are going on a field expedition now we are going to a farm and there we will we will be sh uh, shown how harvesting happens so now we'll be happy yeah, you can go and see if you look at harvesting harvesting is a time of celebration nature has given its bounty the crops are there and we celebrate that bounty in, uh, with joy so now if those crops are not cut at the right time they will anyway die and they will be wasted uh, but the crops are cut then nature is giving its bounty and we are taking it now, in contrast if you are told that if your child comes and tells you that you know we are going on a field expedition we are going to a slaughterhouse to see how animals are slaughtered he says what no no i don't want you to go there why not you know there is there is brutality over there we don't want to expose our children to such brutality killing of animals is uh, is far, is far far more violent far far more painful for the animals it's so painful that most people they don't even want to see it Now, there are videos like meet your meat which are prepared by people for ethical treatment of animals peta if you see the brutality most people will say i don't want to be a part of it and uh, again we might say no this is just emotion this is just our subjective feeling well not just our subjective feeling that uh, maybe the we may see the crops are also shrinking in pain well not exactly because i said the crops are anyway going to die soon if they're not killed with respect to animals it's not like that it's not that animals are killed when they are old it's like they are grown and in an unnatural situation and killed when usually when they are the fattest so not when they are oldest and then beyond that from a scientific perspective we understand that the nervous how much pain a living being suffers that is proportional to the nervous system and its development so in most animals the nervous system is developed far far more Than in the plants, that for not only it is we who perceive the pain of animals and not perceive the pain of plants. That's true, but apart from that also, in terms of the experience of pain, in terms of the development of the nervous system, animals feel far greater pain. So, do we really want to be uh, <clears throat> causing so much pain just so that we can have some tasty food? And actually speaking, the irony is that. uh meat is not intrinsically tasty also and there are many fruits and vegetables we could eat without even cooking them nowadays eating raw foods is also become like a health fad or a healthy habit but how many people can eat raw meat most of the what we call as the taste of meat it is not so much the taste of meat it is a taste of spices and other thing that are added to the meat so we have to think for ourselves is it really a healthy thing to do so is it something which we want to do so from a <clears throat> biological perspective the structure of the human beings so, so overall we humans can eat meat but we humans in the sense that biologically there are canine teeth and our body can digest it now i haven't even gone into the health consequences further overall from a health perspective in many parameters meeting it avoiding it meat is much better if somebody gets a heart attack somebody gets any kind of heart problems the first thing they say is at least give up red meat doctors tell them so in india till now it's like becoming 
non vegetarian or eating meat is considered to be cool but in the west veganism is catching up and it's spreading quite rapidly and more and more people are turning towards uh, eating uh, violence free food that's what they call it because this is i don't want to be part of violence they're not doing it because of some religious beliefs they're not because doing it because of cultural imposition they're just doing it because of evolved consciousness they see what all meat eating entails and they don't want to be a part of it so in a sense we indians think that imitating the west and becoming modernized and becoming cool involves eating meat and not eating meat is old fashioned but actually if we really want to consider what is fashionable in the west it is giving up eating meat veganism is huge in the western world so i would say that rather than simply using some arguments to justify certain things let's expand our consciousness understand the reality of how things are and then then take a judicious decision about our dietary choices okay yes to that part about uh, uh, quran muslims would you like to address that yeah now every religion has a certain level of uh, contextual application of universal principles so if we consider the quran itself or when it evolved historically it evolved in a desert place and not much grows over there the arabic part is a desert so you know if there is not much herbs and other things growing then meat eating is a natural way to live over there so in that sense within the quran there is not that much emphasis on eating vegetarian food but there are references where it is said that if you can if you can live without killing animals do that now as far as uh killing specific animals is concerned pork is for explicitly forbidden uh pig flesh is not to be eaten that's the idea within the quran now why pork there could be specific cultural reasons but overall we can look at the principle the principle is that even when we are eating meat don't eat it indiscriminately there is some amount of regulation that is mandated through the banning of pork uh, over there so now with respect to cows uh, well that's a is cow killing or uh, recommended or insisted on in the quran or banned in the quran you see as i said every religious text is a historical document apart from a transcendental wisdom being given in it so in the context well as i said not and many animals were available not much vegetarian food was available animals were there and even if you consider the desert perspective it is not that cows were growing uh, cows were extensive in that part of the world so that cows should be offered by killing that's definitely not like a mandatory statement in the quran definitely not because if you see when a religion evolves what is available so 7th century middle east it is not that cows are available abundantly for people in that part of the world and there are so many parts of the world in, in, in even now where cows are not that easily available if you consider malaysia indonesia the kind the way the number of cows that are there say in india and in some other parts of the world is not that extensive so muslims in those part of the world definitely don't consider that we have to sacrifice cows itself so they may sacrifice some other animals somehow in india while there has been some amount of uh, significant religious differences and conflicts because of that between hindus and muslims but some aspects were some differences were escalated intentionally by the british because of their policy of divide and rule so there has been violence because of muslim invaders on uh, on hindus even before muslims came before sorry the british came but it was more we could say religious zeal of certain extremists and it was there was financial consideration they were plundering basically but muslims they basically realized that after they came to india if you consider the difference between muslims and british is that the british never considered india to be their home 
they felt this india is so hot in fact the british considered that if anybody was deputed to india from britain they would consider being deputed to be india like a punishment oh i have to go to this hot disease filled country and uh, they would try to go back as quickly as possible many of them so they never made india their home the british the muslims on the other hand many of them made india their home even their not just uh, their rulers they they started rule, living over here ruling over here and uh, there was some amount of syncretism syncretism means cultural synthesis that happened so over a period of time muslims started giving hindus the space for doing their practices and they would do their own practices but this institutionalization of killing of cows that there is a history to that and uh, it it was something which we could say came during the british times and how much the british played a role in causing that the specific percentage of the role can be debated is debatable but they definitely played a significant role in that so killing cows and offering them in uh, eid or something like that that is not a part of the central ritual of islam and it doesn't have a specific mandate against killing cows nor does it have a specific mandate for killing cows within the cultural landscape in which the quran evolved cows were not a prominent part and that's why they don't get any prominent mention over there so every religion has its contextualized application that contextualized application means that say even if a particular animal is to be sacrificed according to particular ritual what if that animal is not available in that part of the world what are they going to do are they going to import that animal from another part of the world just to sacrifice it no there is the the muslim clergy the ulama as they are called they find out how that particular principle is to be applied in their particular situation and then they will apply accordingly so i would say that in india at least cow killing is it involves a lot of strong uh, opposition and uh, it 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 is best not done it's definitely so i would say that in my understanding as far as i have read in with the quran it's non committal about cow sacrifice uh, of cow killing okay yes prabhu so uh, the next question is uh, i am i am combining questions from um, vwit pune and sggs nanded and from pesit bangalore they are having question on the similar lines the question is about uh, the understanding of scriptures on the basis of god and demi gods so i am putting one question to and that includes others so this is a question uh, that i have faith in scriptures uh, especially bhagavatam but the problem that i face with scriptures is that many different scriptures say many different things like vishnu puran says vishnu is supreme krishna is avatar of lord vishnu shiva puran says that shiva is supreme lord brahma and lord vishnu came from him and then there is ganga we see in the television ganga maya she from her everything emanates and then we see sai baba from him no he is the source of everything so that creates lots of problem because the person arguing with me is also stating scriptures or some particular source and i am also doing the same and both cons can cannot convince each other because our scriptural basis is different or the sources for which we are following is different so how do i convince him that what bhagavatam is the basis ultimate truth and his scripture is uh, not the ultimate subordinate okay so when there are various worshipable deities how do we convince people that what the bhagavatam is saying is the highest well first of all we have to ask this question do we have to convince anyone you know that within the vedic tradition there was worship of vishnu there are worship of the devtas so different people are at different levels on their spiritual evolution and they will be attracted to different ways of worshiping or different objects of worship also and the vedic tradition provides people room for that the system of worship of the devtas is also created by krishna krishna says that it is i who uh, give the devtas the power to power to give rewards and it is i who make the faith of the worshipers of the devtas strong 
So it's Krishna who has created that system. And our purpose should be to elevate people's faith, not damage people's faith. So in a world which is completely materialistic, if somebody is worshipping some sacred deity or some sacred icon and is that is because of that some amount of regulation in their life is coming, some amount of piety in their life is coming, that is a step up from where they are. So if we consider, say, if a person, if, a, if I say a person has two children, one of them is brilliant and they get 80% marks in the exam. The other kid is mediocre and just sneaks through, passes through by getting 40%. And today both of them have come with their results and both of them have got 60%. So the father would say to the person who used to get 40%, Shabash, well done. And then to the other, he would say that, Badmash, what have you done? And now the second one said, I got the same marks as he, why are you chastising me? Well, your level is different. So for a person who is at 40%, if they're coming to 60%, that is laudable. But for somebody who's 80%, coming to 60% is bad. So what is this three levels compared to? 40% is simply materialism or atheism. 60% is say worship of the devtas. 80% is worship of Krishna. So if somebody has come from 40% to 60%, we need to appreciate that. And if we start getting too much into a polemic, into a argumentation and debate and everything, what will happen is they will get confused. Okay, you know, this whole religion is many business. Different people say that different people are supreme and uh, I don't know how to figure it out. It's all confusing. Better let me get out of this whole religion business. And if they become materialistic and atheistic because of that. So they are going from 60% to 40%. We have done disservice over there. So our purpose is, okay, if somebody is 60%, help them to come to 80% if you can. But don't make that into a major issue. So we cannot convince anyone. We cannot convert anyone. It is Krishna who does that from within their hearts. And we can become one instrument in giving that conviction to people. So when people worship some particular uh, worshipable object, it is not just based on logic or scripture. It is based on their culture, their experiences, whatever they may have had. And like that, there are many other factors involved. So as far as, so now this is all this is not to say that scripture is not to be considered. Definitely it's important, but we can't reduce people's faith and worship simply down to logic or scripture alone. They are important and they should be the basis, but functionally many things come together, many factors determine who somebody worships. This could be their family upbringing, their tradition, their social circles, and whatever experiences they have got within that. So first thing is be sensitive. First thing, is, so be sensitive and you know be humble. Humble in the sense that uh, sensitive in the sense that we don't want to damage people's faith. Humble in the sense that it is not who we who convince. It is Krishna may use as, as an instrument and he may use us as one instrument among many to elevate people's understanding. Having said that, we could look at scripture itself. And Vyasadeva has spoken the Bhagavatam in his maturity. So it is the Bhagavatam itself says that you know, all the other scriptures were spoken are written and as they were not satisfied. So he is giving the truth that brings the highest satisfaction to the human heart. So we could look at the scripture itself and there is a Taratamya. Taratamya means classification or hierarchical arrangement within scripture. And this is true with, with books of, with generally there could be various books and there could be hierarchy within those books in various areas that happens. So within the scriptures also there is a hierarchy. So is Vishnu Puran valid? Is Ganesh, is Shiva Puran or others valid? Yes, they are valid. They are giving truths that will encourage faith in the followers of Lord Shiva. So when Krishna says, I make their faith strong in what they want to worship. If somebody wants to worship yo yo yam yam tanum bhakta shraddhaya architam ichchati tasya tasya achalam shraddham tam eva vidhidham yaham. Krishna says whichever form somebody wants to worship, I make their shraddha achala. I make their faith strong. So how does Krishna do that? One way Krishna does that is through the scriptures 
Let's talk about those devatas. So they're also part of Krishna's plan for people's elevation. So we need to respect even those scriptures. At the same time, there is a hierarchy within the scriptures. So now there is a, on my website, a spiritual scientist, if you search for it, there is a verse in one of the uh, Shaivite Puranas, which, so basically the Puranas and the, the worship that is recommended in the Puranas, that also falls in a hierarchy. So different people based on their level of consciousness will naturally gravitate toward certain objects of worship. So there are certain kinds of people who may be more in the mode of ignorance who may worship Lord Shiva. Now again, when we say this, this doesn't mean that every worshipper of Lord Shiva is in the mode of ignorance. No, not like that. It's not that say every worshipper of Vishnu will be in the mode of goodness. But there is an overall orientation of the human mind that is attracted to a particular kind of worship. There are always exceptions. But so, the, so in one of the Shaivite Puranas, it is said that if one of the Sattvic Puranas, Sattvic Puranas means those which talk about the worship of Vishnu, and there is a, and there is the Tamasic Puranas, that is which talks about the worship of um, Shiva. If there is a difference between the two, then if the two scriptures con conflict, then then has to focus on the Sattvic Puran rather than on the Tamasic Puran. So we can look at Vyasadeva's evolution. We can look at the traditional uh, at, at the scriptural Taratamya based on the hierarchy of scripture based on scripture itself. And then uh, based on that we can understand what is the object of worship. And ultimately we don't have to spend too much time in debating uh, and arguing with people. If we can find out what is it that is attracting them to the worship of a particular devta, quite often it's not just the devta. It's the culture around it, it's the atmosphere around that, the experience that they will get in that. If in Krishna Bhakti they can get that or a richer experience, they'll be attracted to Krishna worship. So the world has enough conflicts and we don't have to increase the conflicts in the world. So in a sensitive, humble way, if we can elevate people's faith, that is good. And how to do that? I gave some guidelines for that. That would be broadly my answer. Okay. Yes, Prabhu. Prabhu the next question is a one line question. Why are descriptions of material things are there in the spiritual world? What material things are we talking about? Maybe he is talking uh, not only in the spiritual world, but also in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Some concepts which are meant, uh, which are elevating, meant to elevate us in the material life also. And also something maybe, um, that's what I can guess. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, see why the description of material things given in the Bhagavatam? It depends on what material things we are referring to. See, first of all, we don't have to demonize material things. Material things are required for living in the world. And in the Vedic tradition, there was provision for providing material things also. So we could say, Vidyamcha Vidyamcha Yastad Vedo Bhayam Vishopanishad says that. The knowledge of how to navigate this world and how to go beyond this world. Both knowledges are required for, for living life fruitfully. So it's not that everything material is taboo. It is that the challenge problem is when the material is, is made so important that the spiritual is neglected or rejected. That's when the problem is there. We live in the material world, there are material needs and the material needs are also fulfilled through scripture. So, but the problem is people may focus only on the material teachings of the scripture and then they may not look at the spiritual teachings. So that is a challenge which has to be carefully addressed. So having material things being talked about in scripture is not a problem because we live in the material world and we have material needs. So the scripture is like a kalpataru, desire fulfilling tree. And people do have material desires. So what is better that they become atheistic and they try to fulfill their material desires by whatever means they can, or they get their material desires fulfilled within a religious context by which they are staying religiously regulated at some level. 
their faith in some higher realities is being nourished even while they're fulfilling their material desires well, secondly the, definitely second option is better so but we could say that if somebody is sick and in pain they need pain killing medication and they need curative medication also so we could say while we are in material existence our material needs are like the pain killing medication and our spiritual needs they are like the curative medication so the problem really comes when somebody takes only the material medication or the, only the pain killing medicine and stops taking the curative medicine so that's what has happened in today's world through technology technology provides for our material needs and material desires in many ways but it's completely non spiritual context or anti spiritual also sometimes and that's unhealthy so we shouldn't treat the material as taboo or as untouchable material needs are also important but within the hierarchy the painkillers shouldn't be considered more important than curative medicines that is an ignorant way of looking at things and it's a destructive way because the disease will worsen now having said that um, while material serves a functional need material things can also serve a transcendental purpose material things can remind us of krishna because we live in the material world and our senses are going to perceive material things so in the bhagavad gita there is a whole chapter called vibhuti yoga where krishna talks about uh, material descriptions and of uh, extraordinary material manifestations and he says that the extraordinariness of those manifestations reflects his splendor it's a spark of his splendor yad yad vibhuti matsatvam shrimadurjitam eva va tatta deva va gachatvam mama tejo amsha sambhava so we see a, a magnificent rainbow we see a spectacular mountain peak we see a glorious river uh, and that list which is given in the bhagavad gita is indicative it is not exhaustive so today somebody might go to somebody like the assembly eiffel tower and look at uh, that majestic architecture and if that makes them think of a higher realities well the eiffel tower might be constructed by human beings but it is it is indicative it can point to a higher reality is this this humans who have special talents the talents come from god it is by god's grace that this is manifesting so the material can also be used to point our consciousness towards the transcendental and in that context also material descriptions are given in scripture and uh, whenever say analysis of matter is done in terms of describing the universe or the universal elements it's always done in a theistic context so there are i would conclude his answer by uh, dividing this into three parts see first is that the, the ultimate purpose of life is to develop love for krishna and attain krishna mm-hmm. so for doing that we need knowledge about krishna where we are directly focusing on spirituality okay so that is the most important part of scriptural teaching and that should never be overlooked but at the same time we live in the material world so for functioning in the material world certain things are required and th- their knowledge is also given in scripture and while living in the material world we are going to perceive material things so instead of simply divorcing the material from the spiritual and we look at the material and we don't think about krishna we can we can get a vision how the material can be infused with spiritual connections then during our direct worship of krishna we are thinking of krishna and also while we are interacting with material pers- material things and perceiving material things they can also remind us of krishna and when our material needs are provided for if they are provided for in the religious context then we are thankful to krishna for having provided us with the material needs and that also reminds us of krishna so remembrance of krishna doesn't have to be restricted only to spiritual stimuli we want remembrance of krishna to include to be inclusive in the sense of including our entire life so whether it is our material needs whether it is our material perceptions or whether it is our spiritual stimuli that we interact with through all of them the remembrance of krishna can be invoked and that's why material descriptions are given in even in transcendental books like the bhagavatam okay yes praji so this second last question for today um when i explain my friend this is a student from sbot tirupati he says when i explain my friend regarding the bliss that we experience in the spiritual world he asked me why god has to has the need to create this material world and sends us to this material world why can't he just make everyone to live in the spiritual world 
Okay. So if I create the material world at all, mm, mm, well, in future, most of you will have family and you will have children. Now children often are mm, a headache or a heartache when they don't obey their parents or they do something bad. But ask any parent, would they want to replace their child with a perfectly obedient robot which looks just like their child? Now we can't manufacture, we're not able to manufacture that right now, but what if in future we can do it? Well, they won't want that. Hmm? Why? Because you know, with the robot, there is no reciprocation of love. So reciprocation of love requires personality, requires individuality, requires liberty, requires freedom. So our existence is for the purpose of love. That we reciprocate love with Krishna and he reciprocates love with us. And love requires freedom. So freedom itself has no meaning unless there is room for exercising that freedom. If somebody says, you know, you are completely free to express your mind as long as you agree with me. Well, that's, you know, I'm not free at all, that means. So, if Krishna is giving us free will, then free will means that there has to be an arena where we can express that free will. So the very existence of free will requires the existence of a world where that free will can be exercised. And that world is the material world. So rather than saying that it is Krishna who has sent us to this world, it is rather the world exists because free will exists. And some, in some cases, in some situations, some people want to use their free will in a way that is unhealthy. Well, that's painful even for the parents to see when the kids are going on the wrong track. But then that's, that's, the, that's the inevitable price of freedom that sometimes freedom will be misused. So now what the material world serves two purposes. One is experimentation and the other is redirection. So if we think that there are things other than say loving and serving Krishna that can make us happy or happier than what we are, then the world offers us many options to experiment like that. And then Krishna is also there to guide us. So it also offers options for redirection. So if we experiment and eventually realize this is not really giving me happiness, then we become ready to redirect. So the world is created because we have free will and free will means there is an opportunity for experimentation. The world gives that, but along with that, Krishna himself is present in the world. Krishna gives scriptures, Krishna sends, creates various theistic traditions and teaches within those traditions by which he gives opportunity for us to redirect our sins toward him. That's the brief answer. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So the uh, last question for today, actually there are lots of questions, Proji, but uh, we are already over time. So I'll take the last question for today. There are different pathways. This question is asked from the students of PES in Bangalore. There are different ways to reach the ultimate. Um, how can we recommend bhakti only? Because people in different are in different mindsets and their mentalities. They can choose their way. Not everyone is of the same consciousness. They might not understand Krishna consciousness properly. As they have I think that this answer is the same as what I answered about the Devtas. Okay. Is there something specifically different in this question? He is telling that they might not be able to understand Krishna consciousness properly. Okay, so then don't, don't disturb their faith. Don't disturb their faith. Elevate their faith as much as we can. Okay. I saw I saw one question in the chat that okay. was you know that vegans don't eat meat. Sorry, vegans are not vegans don't take milk. You want me to answer that or you want me? I, want me? I did not get that question, Baji. If you can kindly read it, answer that is very very nice. Okay. So vegans don't take milk. Well, yes, I think that's a minor point. We don't have to make that into a big thing. The fact that they don't eat meat is itself something which is uh, very laudable. Now, as far as they're not eating meat, I would say there is three things. There is a practical reason. There is a philosophical reason. Or rather, that can be analyzed from the perspective of uh, practical, emotional, and philosophical. 
so from a practical perspective uh the meat eating in the the meat packing industry as it is called or the animal husbandry that is done in today's world the meat is often a product of violence it is not at all like in a traditional culture where uh, where the cow would be treated with great affection and uh, cow would be treated with great affection and cow would be treated like a family member and in fact in many times if if there was a cow in the family people would take milk from their cow not from other cows also not always but in some cases because there's a personal bond among the uh, among the cow and the family members so there so the cow would naturally out of affection give milk and that milk would be taken but now it has become a business so often the cows are given artificial uh, chemicals by which to maximize their milk product they are their udders are squeezed till blood comes out from them so that they get maximum milk and often they are given artificial fertility drugs so that they have more and more cows far more than their bodies can sustain and uh, that way they can they will give more milk so it has become commercialized and that's why there is a natural understanding of natural apprehension among thoughtful people should we be a part of such milk should we take such milk and that's a valid concern as devotees we often try to take ahimsa milk that means that we try to take milk not just the milk that is available say in the in the supermarkets but if there is cows are taken care of in proper proper way and then the milk is taken from there that is recommended that's what we should take so their concern of milk also being a product of violence it is a valid concern and that is not the way things were done in the tradition so milk was not never in the past in the tradition at least milk was a product of affection not a product of exploitation and violence and pain as it is now so in that sense that concern can be addressed so we even i when i go abroad i also don't take milk in the western world unless there's ahimsa milk and there are many iskon temples which have created uh, farm projects nearby from which they get ahimsa milk it's it's difficult it's somewhat little more expensive but there are many conscious people who are ready to pay a little bit more to get milk which is non violent so that vegan concern is valid but now from a philosophical perspective some vegans go to a great extreme and they say that we shouldn't use animals at all animals are not for human use well you and therefore we should not take any animal products well that might be taking things a bit to an extreme so what happens whenever people take up any school of thought there is a tendency to absolutize that so we so that we shouldn't we shouldn't use animals for anything at all well that's fine but you the word use itself involves a certain value judgment we live in an interconnected universe and if we consider cows unless we are talking about wild cows which are quite a different species now cows need humans to take care of them as much as humans uh, humans need cow milk so it's a reciprocation so sometimes the vegan philosophy whatever philosophy is underlying veganism that goes to an extreme where they recommend or even insist on a complete compartmentalization between humans and animals that humans should not take anything from the animal world well um, that mean that may be taking it to an extreme because if you are not taking anything from the animal world then who will take care of cows and why and cows may be neglected and be slaughtered and may become extinct many things can come up because of that so we can't have rigid compartmentalization there is going to be cooperation there is going to be reciprocation and that reciprocation has to be done in a way that is uh, that is gentle that is affectionate that is non violent so we appreciate the concern of vegans in terms of the emotions and the practicalities involved over there at the same time the underlying if, if they make it a philosophical point then we have to make it clear that philosophically nature has been created in such a way that we are meant to cooperate with each other and milk 
is if a cow is taken care of sorry if taken care of properly then a cow gives more milk than what its calf can take and in fact it may be unhealthy for the calf to take all the milk that it is given now that may not be true in today's world because the cows are not taken care of affectionately we have many ex we have examples of devotee farm communities where you know, some people abandon a cow because they say she is not giving much milk we can't afford it and that cow is brought to a devotee goshala and there they start taking care of it and the cow gives more milk so so it's not that we are taking away the animal section or we are causing animal pain there is within nature there is a system of cooperation and we can participate in that system of cooperation in a cooperative way that's why milk is an integral part of traditional indian culture or traditional spiritual culture dharmic culture in general and that was completely a reciprocation of affection not at all a product of violence so thank you very much for all your thoughtful questions and um, as i had mentioned earlier on the spiritual scientist dot com there are almost 7000 more than 6000 questions that have been answered so you may find the questions that were not answered radhishyam will answer them tomorrow um um he will answer it and you will be uh, you can have that um you can look at that uh if that not you can check on my website also answers are available there for many questions thank you very much hare krishna